Maggie Stankowitz, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event. Before we get started, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on Advise Health. At Advise Health, we analyze processes, implement solutions, and deliver quality educational opportunities for healthcare entities of all sizes. We have been in existence for over 13 years and employ the industry's top auditing and consulting experts. We offer an extensive catalog of services, including HIPAA and compliance analysis, medical documentation auditing services, and educational opportunities for a number of specialty-specific topics, including chiropractic services, DME, home health, and clinical documentation improvement. The educational seminar you are about to view is just one of many services that Advise Health advisory sector has to offer. We provide the medical billing and coding community with 30 free CEUs per year through our monthly webinars and coding newsletter. Our priority and promise to the healthcare community is to always tailor our services to our clients' needs and budgets. <clears throat> we have an exceptional speaker for today's presentation, Dr. Phil Smith from Medmore. Dr. Phil Smith is a dual-boarded physician who accomplishes huge projects, including automating healthcare operations, achieving high levels of physician adoption of technologies, as well as healthcare operations and analytics. He formerly served for over nine years as vice president and CMIO at the 44 Hospital Multi-State Adventist Health System, and most recently automated the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. He is the author of Making Computerized Provider Order Entry Work, which is published internationally. He currently does independent healthcare and management analytics, as well as technology consulting, and is an advisor to medical software companies, healthcare organizations, and to an innovative global medical device company. Now for some general housekeeping items. We will be monitoring questions throughout the webinar, so feel free to send in any questions that you have to all organizers at any time. There will also be a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. This webinar will be recorded and sent to all attendees, along with a certificate for 1.5 CEUs. These items will be sent to you within the next three to five business days. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Phil Smith, who will begin the presentation. Well, thank you, Maggie, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, you're having a great day. Uh, last month when I did this, uh, we were in the middle of a tropical storm, and I think we have another one threatening today in Tampa, Florida. So hopefully uh, lightning will not uh, knock anything out today, but we did fine. I'm very excited to talk today uh, to you all about population health, and I'm going to take a very interesting twist on it and actually teach you about cause and effect diagrams or Ishikawa diagrams. Uh, I think it'll be fun, but uh, there'll be a lot of data that I think is very helpful um, uh, to understand what's happening to our population and why this is such an important topic to us as, a, as Americans. So um, I do have these following objectives that I want to achieve today. If you're listening on the phone only, uh, we're going to understand the impact chronic disease is having on the United States population and our health care costs. We're going to understand the impact of hospital readmissions for chronic care. And we're going to review the numerous factors that lead to readmissions and post-hospital mortality. And this topic should be interest to you if, if uh, you're a health care uh, participant as a patient or if you're a health care a uh, provider uh, in healthcare as a professional or in operations and uh, to better understand uh, what's going on with our environment. So I'm going to start by giving you some background on chronic illness in the United States, uh, which is a growing challenge uh, in our industry. And when we're talking about chronic illness, um, we're talking about diseases that you hear about every day. And there's an increase in the patients who have uh, more than one chronic illness. And this leads to more costs, more hospitalizations, and more emergency department care. So we're going to look at some statistics that are provided on Medicare beneficiaries. And to remind you, Medicare beneficiaries are typical, uh, typically people over the age of 65 or people younger than 65 who have been disabled and are receiving Medicare benefits. And currently today, if we look at uh, Medicare beneficiaries, um, about a third have zero to one chronic condition. Another third have two to three. 
but the other uh, third uh, has four to six or more chronic conditions with 14 percent of the Medicare population having six or more chronic conditions. So that means that two-thirds of Medicare beneficiaries have two or more chronic conditions that need to be managed by health care. And when we look at the 15 leading chronic conditions, I think it's no surprise that high blood pressure is the number one chronic condition uh, in the Medicare population of over 65 mainly, and high, followed by high cholesterol and ischemic heart disease. And ischemic heart disease means anything that can cause uh, angina, which is chest pain, or heart attack. And then we go down uh, through the rest of it and uh, get down. So if you look at the highlights of this, the big five are high blood pressure, cholesterol, heart disease, arthritis, and diabetes. And you probably know uh, multiple people that have uh, two or more of these. And if we look at the spending, uh, which is why this is such a big impact to our United States health care budget, if we look at per capita spending across Medicare um, recipients, and we're talking only data on fee-for-service, so this would not be including those who are participating with a health maintenance organization such as Medicare Advantage Plan. Uh, but based on fee-for-service spending, uh, you can see that the average Medicare uh, beneficiary spend is $9,738 a year. But if you look at the population that have zero to one uh, chronic conditions, uh, the spending is about 2000 a year, uh, which relates to about $150 a month. But if you look at people that have six or more of these chronic conditions, then you can see that the spending is almost four times or 400% increase over the average spending at $32,658. So uh, this is a huge impact in spending when someone has more than chronic condition. And if we look at the Medicare recipients and look across all ages, um, so now we're including the people that are disabled and less than 65, it's pretty natural to realize if a person is disabled and has six or more chronic care condition, then their Medicare spending uh, per year is going to be even higher because they probably, uh, being disabled, they're probably less active and have more health challenges. But uh, you can see that at all ages, the younger than 65 population on Medicare have higher um, annual expenditures than the people over the age of 65. So this is not just a um, spending problem among our elderlies. And obviously, uh, if someone is younger, they probably have a longer life expectancy. Now, if we look at what, um, what kind of a breakout of how these things are mixed together, um, and take a moment to look at this graph. Um, so if you look at uh, depression, depression occurs isolated in about 10% of patients with depression, but the other 90% have one or more chronic conditions as well. And you go all the way down to heart failure, where it's almost never the condition that you have heart failure by itself and no other chronic conditions. And in fact, 55% of the people with heart failure have five or more other conditions, putting them in that six plus category. So the purpose of showing you this slide is that certain diseases uh, really are associated with more uh, number of chronic conditions. So the highest is heart failure, uh, which also has the highest rate of readmission to the hospital and the highest mortality of all the conditions on the list, uh, with stroke being um, almost equal to it, um, but again, is rarely found alone. So if we look at um, uh, distribution of the beneficiaries by age groups or age brackets, you can see that um, if you're younger, you're less likely to have more than one uh, chronic condition. But if you're over the um, six plus conditions, uh, as you go up in age, uh, that graph shifts to the older you are, the more likely you are to have uh, more chronic conditions to where we get that 25% uh, 
of the over 85 percent uh, Medicare recipients have six plus conditions. And with more people living to higher ages, you can see that this uh, does impact uh, cost of providing care. Now, if we look at uh, the impact to hospitalizations, uh, and we'll start on the left. This is the all taken together that uh, if we look at an average Medicare beneficiary that's on fee-for-service, 79% will never be admitted to the hospital during, during a uh, year. But 3% will be admitted three or more times during that year. But when we go out to look at the six plus chronic condition level, 16% uh, will have three or more hospital admissions a year, and only 37 will avoid being in the hospital. So essentially two thirds will end up in the hospital during the year when they have uh, six plus chronic conditions. And then if we look at emergency room utilization, which is what ED stands for emergency department, you'll look overall that 7% uh, have three or more visits in the total uh, beneficiary population, and 68% never end up in the emergency room at all during the year. But if you go out to the people with six plus chronic conditions, you can see that only 30% avoid the emergency room during the year, and the largest percentage, 27%, actually end up with three or more ER visits. So um, beneficiaries with high numbers of chronic diseases end up in the hospital more and end up in the emergency department more as well. So we talked about the increasing numbers of patients with numerous chronic conditions. Uh, let's look about the spending uh, for Medicare recipients. Uh, we already looked at the cost per uh, annual expenditure, but let's look at it as total, total dollars spent. And you can see at the bottom that total Medicare spending for people with zero to one chronic diseases uh, is just under $20 billion a year. But when you go up the scale to people with six or more conditions, uh, they are consuming 141 uh, billion dollars a year, almost 142 billion dollars a year, which is roughly uh, a little over 700 percent or seven times more expenditure of total dollars uh, for the cost of care. And when you look at the colors, you'll see 41 percent of that goes for inpatient care um, and 7 um, percent goes to durable medical equipment and the rest are divided under uh, ambulatory care in the physician office, uh, outpatient, other outpatient cares, and treatments. And if we look at the distribution of Medicare spending, you can see that um, the beneficiaries that have six or more conditions um, only represent 14% of the Medicare recipients but they also represent 46% of the total dollars spent, where the bottom one-third, the 32% that's blue on the left, uh, only result in 7% of the total spending. So um, if you look at that another way, 93% of the Medicare spending is spent on people with two or more chronic diseases. So we've talked a little bit about more readmissions uh, within the group. And um, if we look at hospital admissions, so readmissions, so this means the person has left the hospital and actually returned to the hospital within 30 days uh, with the same diagnosis. You can see those 14% uh, of Medicare recipients that have six or more conditions end up with 70% of the readmissions. And um, the percentages fall based on the chronic uh, conditions. And if we break these out by age, you'll see again uh, that the largest group is actually the less than 65 people, which is surprising to a lot of folks because they think it's the over 65 that end up in the hospital readmitted more 
but it's actually the uh, younger disabled patients on Medicare that end up being readmitted. And um, if you look at all uh, fee-for-service Medicare beneficiaries, um, you know, that number is 11% for the less than 65, but it jumps to 32% uh, when you get up to the six or more chronic conditions. So that's a pretty big jump. And if we look at office visits, which obviously uh, we're facing areas of physician shortages, and so uh, physician office visits uh, consume a lot of resources from the patient's time to travel back and forth to the office for coming in for tests for the expense of physician office visits. And you look at physician office visits, and if we look at that uh, purple group again, uh, which has the same colors, we look at people that have, in this case, uh, 13 or more physician visits. Uh, it represents 19% of all uh, Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, but if you look at people with six or more conditions, 46 of them will make more than a visit a month to a doctor's office. So that's a lot of care that's uh, going on. And if you're uh, in the well category, uh, you have no chronic conditions, you're a, a third of you never go to the doctor even during the year. And then we also have a growing population that's eligible for chronic care management. Uh, however, very few are getting the coaching and management that they really need, um, which is a shame. So what I mean by chronic care coaching is, or management, is looking at the patient across all the areas where they get care. And if you have a disease like uh, congestive heart failure, um, often you end up in the hospital and you get acute care in the hospital with a lot of fine adjustments, but then you transition back to home. Well, we have to acknowledge that your home care is actually, if not equal, probably more important than the hospital care because that's the time period where we help to fine-tune your medications versus your lifestyle and to try to minimize the number of medications you're on, to try to minimize anything that might uh, exacerbate your heart failure, and we want to try to prevent a readmission to the hospital or even an emergency room visit. And there are strategies that have been proven to help that, uh, but they're not always being offered to patients. And um, as we'll talk in a few minutes, one of those is remote patient monitoring, uh, which today only 2% of the patients who probably should have remote uh, monitoring are actually getting it done. And when we look at um, the number of beneficiaries that are eligible for chronic care management in the United States, you can see that that number is going up uh, from, and um, it's going up in all payer groups, so Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial, so that we're seeing a large number of Americans, about 125 million, that will be eligible for chronic care management uh, by 2020, which is just four years away. And if we look at the available dollars that have been pledged by Medicare and the private insurers to cover this, uh, they are planning to invest over $70 billion uh, because they find this is a very wise business practice to provide uh, reimbursement for care in the home and transition management care and coaching because it reduces the more expensive inpatient care and uh, improves the quality of life. So the challenges to us, and if you're a member of a health system, um, we all know that healthcare costs are skyrocketing, and despite uh, politicians who are promising decreasing the cost curve uh, during the last few years of Obamacare, we've seen premiums uh, skyrocket and costs skyrocket. And um, it, I know personally, as a, someone that buys uh, private insurer insurance, um, I went from uh, pre-Obamacare premiums for a family of two in our 50s um, of a premium of around $6,000 to 
uh, over $12,000 a year in premiums just in the last three years. And uh, I'm sure if you're a healthcare employer or you're um, providing your own insurance, you know that uh, healthcare premiums are skyrocketing. And we know that from the data on chronic care management and from remote patient monitoring that we can lower costs. Uh, but most health systems have not really gotten into this field effectively because they often don't have a strategy on how to make it work. And uh, there are a lot of tele technology companies that have been entering the field uh, with really great name recognition and, and some great products but they have little experience with uh, actually integrating this into the workflow and understanding the interchange between healthcare systems, the physicians, and the patients uh, to create a workable model that makes sense and can actually solve uh, problems in real people. So uh, most of these companies are, are approaching this as more of a tactical approach, which is do, 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 and, and rather than a strategy of looking at the overview of how do we leverage all the technology we have available from the ability to uh, leverage the internet, uh, to leverage uh, the growth of self-care and self-responsibilities of patients who now can uh, leverage the internet for data sources, sometimes good information sources and sometimes poor the ability to monitor in the home, the ability to do remote uh, virtual visits through uh, telemedicine or what we call virtual visits through video conferencing uh, that is secure, uh, the ability to put uh, medical devices in the home both at the clinical um, level that's um, approved uh, for use in the home as well as the Internet of Things such as fitness trackers, Fitbits, uh, widening devices, uh, little um, devices that people have in their home from their smartphones to their wristbands. And uh, a lot of the vendors have not really quite understood what the complexity is of all the different things that health systems and insurers have on their plate today. Um, we just went through the last five years uh, digitalizing the electronic medical record as a response to the uh, stimulus of 2009 and the uh, High Tech Act, which create meaningful use dollars. And now often people are back to doing maintenance things uh, within their health systems. And they don't have a lot of bandwidth to figure out how to make population health really effective and how to make it work. And also they may not have the data to know where they're at and how to manage it. And we know that with data, we can actually decide what to do next and, and where to invest our dollars and our efforts. And then uh, there's been gaps in creating uh, systems that aren't integrated with our electronic health records. And so we create different places for patients to go and different places for doctors and nurses to go. And we need to be thinking more of a seamless integration so that everything is in one place so that when a doctor is making decisions, he or she has access to all the data to do that, including uh, labs and uh, x-ray uh, results and, and notes from other providers. But they also want to be able to benefit from the uh, information gathered at home. Uh, in fact, years ago, we used to talk about white coat hypertension, uh, which is high blood pressure that is measured when you come into the office and you're nervous of seeing the doctor and your blood pressure may be high but when you get home, it may be normal. And this has led to the concern that some people that are on uh, high blood pressure medicine like being overtreated and uh, not getting the right medications uh, to be able to do it. So uh, all these are challenges right now we have. So um, one of the impacts to uh, post-hospital care and um, is really a discharge from the hospital uh, should be seen as a transition of care. And we've had this very paternalistic model in healthcare for the last uh, 50 years where a patient leaves the hospital and we give them discharge instructions and we tell them, uh, we'll go follow up um, with your doctor and 
30 years ago, it was your own doctor taking care of you in the hospital. And uh, when your doctor discharged you from the hospital, they, they were still following you and you had that continuity of care. But today, the vast majority of non-surgical care in the United States is actually being done uh, by a hospital-based physician called as a hospitalist, uh, which is a doctor that only works in the hospital. And the idea is uh, once the patient leaves the hospital, that care must be transitioned to a physician in an office practice or a clinic practice outside of the hospital. And this has created some huge challenges for the industry uh, because the follow-up uh, needs to be timely and it must be informed. And sometimes we don't do a very good job of handing off information from the hospital-based physician to the office or community-based physician. And so the treatment plan may not be clear. Uh, the patient may not be for, fully informed on what the plan is. And frankly, we don't always have a safe and effective handoff. And by that means that we have a clear plan and the patient understands it. The doctor who's discharging the patient understands it, and the doctor who's going to be continuing care understands it. Otherwise, the patient is at great risk. And I'm going to give you an example of a very typical congestive heart failure patient. And congestive heart failure is, as I said, the most expensive condition uh, that we treat among the chronic diseases um, as a group of a disease group that literally has lots of other things associated. Now, we may spend more dollars per case on, on cancer treatment, but congestive heart failure is consuming uh, more dollars than anything else in the United States. And congestive heart failure is when your left ventricle, or the left side of your heart, is typically uh, not pumping as well as it should be. And uh, because your right side and your left side of your heart need to be pumping exactly the same amount of blood um, each beat. So the right heart is pumping blood through your lungs to pick up oxygen, and an equal amount of blood must be pumped with that same heartbeat through the rest of your body to take oxygen out to your tissues. And if there's a mismatch between the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart, then several things begin to happen. And the most noticeable is you begin to retain fluid due to some hormonal effects that occur in the heart, and you retain salt and, and fluid. And if it's mostly backed up on the right side of your heart, uh, you'll get swollen ankles or even swollen legs or feet or hands. Uh, but if it's backed up on the left side of the heart, you begin getting fluid in your lungs, uh, and that can then lead to um, complete what we call pulmonary edema, which is lungs full of fluid. Uh, that can interrupt your ability to breathe. It can make you short of breath. It can make you uh, gurgle with fluid in your lungs and uh, can uh, actually promote uh, irregularity of the heart and arrhythmias and, and what we call sudden death. So there's a lot of potential complications. And we treat this with a variety of medications. We use uh, what are called ACE inhibitors, which are fluid that work with your kidneys to help um, reduce the pressures in your venous system so it can hold uh, more fluid and has some hormonal effects on the kidney. Uh, it also does some remodeling of the heart muscle to make it more effective. We use uh, beta blockers, which are drugs that reduce some of the excess uh, adrenaline in your bloodstream, which makes you more likely, uh, less likely to have uh, arrhythmias or irregularities of the heart. And uh, we use diuretics, which are um, drugs that work on the kidney to make you expel so, uh, excess sodium or salt. And with that, a large amount of excess water follows the salt out through the urine, and it helps to reduce the amount of blood volume in your body. And then there's a variety of other drugs we use. But uh, typically, a patient with congestive heart failure is on uh, these drugs and, and sometimes others. Uh, and as I said, they're very likely to have more than congestive heart failure. They actually may have multiple diseases. And uh, 
occasionally uh, they'll get short of breath, their oxygen levels in their blood will drop, the fluid retention becomes too much, their lungs fill up with fluid, which precipitates a trip to the emergency room, uh, and ultimately they may be, um, if severe enough, they may be admitted to the intensive care unit or critical care unit of the hospital or to a regular um, medical surgical bed of the hospital. And every day the uh, doctors will be administering um, to the nurses, uh, giving them uh, intravenous medications uh, such as intravenous diuretics to get rid of the excess fluid, uh, reducing uh, the fluid intake that the person has and a variety of fine-tuning measures over a period of days to get that patient out of critical care, out of the intensive care, into a monitored bed, and ultimately uh, into a position that they can go home. So uh, where we might have kept the hospital uh, person in the hospital for a week to 10 days, 10 years ago, uh, typically we keep them in about five to six days. And every day we're making very dramatic uh, fine-tuning of the medications to get them uh, back to where they need to be. Then the patient is ready to go home. And the error is made where often um, the hospitals will say, well, follow up with your doctor uh, within the week. And uh, to the hospitalist, that means see your doctor, you know, before the week's out. Uh, but what that may mean to the patient is, uh, well, I'm going to call the office tomorrow when I get home and see when I can get an appointment. And um, if the office is not in tune to the fact that you just were in the hospital with congestive heart failure and probably need to be seen in one to two days to continue that fine tuning after you've gotten home to um, to return to your normal diet and activity level in your home environment, um, the front desk may say, well, I don't have anything in the week. Uh, can you see Dr. Smith in two weeks? And of course, you're the patient. You just want to get in to see the doctor. And so you say, that's fine. And now we've taken someone who we have invested an incredible amount of money, effort, time, and expertise into fine tuning their disease process and now we send them home to an environment where they're pretty much left on their own for the next three to seven to sometimes ten days and um, a lot can happen in this transition period. So we need to be thinking differently. We need to be thinking about what is our follow-up plan. Do we need a home health nurse or do we need to be monitoring the patient in the home uh, through daily waits uh, through blood pressure and pulse monitoring and, and making sure that uh, there's no deterioration occurs uh, between visits. And in fact, can we continue the fine-tuning process uh, through uh, not only monitoring the vital signs, but also through some um, phone calls and even maybe even virtual visits to, to where we can actually physically see the patient and see if there are any distress. Uh, but oftentimes, uh, as we saw with the people that have congestive failure, they have a lot of other chronic diseases that may be stacked against them, and that's why so many of them end up back in the hospital uh, within the first 30 days, or worse yet, even dying uh, within that first 30 days uh, after leaving the hospital. And most health systems that I talk to uh, don't have the data to know what really happens in the first 30 days post-hospital. Um, because often the care is done outside of the health system uh, where the hospitals have a huge amount of clinical data on the inpatient side and know what happens on the inpatient side. Once they leave the care of that hospitalist, they often don't know how soon was the first visit and when did it actually happen and they don't know when the patient actually ends up being readmitted at a different health system or going to an emergency room that's not part of their health system or even yet if the patient has mortality or passes away in that 30 days. And without that data, often hospitals aren't aware of how big of a problem this really is um, because they really don't get that data until three to six years later 
to know what really happened in that first 30 days. So Maggie, uh, I'd like to pause for a moment and see if there's any questions because um, I set up a really about what we're talking about, about the number of diseases, the cost to our system, and why the system is so broken right now. So before I go to the next phase of the talk, I want to see if we have any questions. Okay. Um, if everybody could please send in any questions that they have to all organizers. We'll give you a few moments to get your questions in for Phil to answer. We do have one. Um, are there any proposed solutions for keeping that data current? Uh, absolutely, and I'll talk about that before it's, uh, uh, that'll be part of what I'll be talking about here in a few minutes. So I'm glad you're going to hang around for it. Great, thank you. Um, we are still waiting to see a few. If you have any questions, um, please just get them in or raise your hand so that we're aware that you're trying to type yours. I know some of this information may require a pretty detailed question. OK, well, I'll continue on. And uh, Maggie, if any more come in. Um, Let's pause and take them before I get so down the road, because now we're going to go in some fun stuff now that I've bored you with data. So readmission is a uh, big problem in the United States, as I said. And uh, under the uh, Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, uh, we began uh, penalizing uh, hospitals um, for their readmission rates and then also publishing data on post-mortality rate. And there are six conditions that are, are penalized uh, that are monitored, uh, three for 2016. And, and those conditions are congestive heart failure, also known as heart failure, or CHF, um, stroke, uh, COPD, which is chronic lung disease, uh, such as emphysema or chronic bronchitis, acute myocardial infarction, which is heart attack, and uh, for surgical patients who have had a coronary artery bypass graft, uh, which is also known as bypass surgery, uh, and for um, people that have total joint replacements. And so um, hospitals are being monitored for this data. And uh, starting in this year for 2016, which uh, 20, fiscal 2016 ends tomorrow, so we'll be moving into uh, Medicare's fiscal year 2017 uh, on Saturday. Um, health systems are going to be penalized 3% of their CMS or Medicare reimbursement. Um, and they'll get that penalty, um, they'll get notified by that penalty at the end of second quarter in 2017. So this is important to keep these numbers in mind, and you'll see why it's a big deal as I go through the slide. So the penalties are based on a health system's three-year average, and then they compare hospitals to all the other hospitals in the United States. And this is basically called benchmarking. So they're looking at the people that are above average, and they're looking at the people that are below average. And, and now uh, for 2016, they've already done the calculations because the 2016 penalty which I said will be leveraged in June of next year, is actually based on discharge data for patients discharged between October 1st of 2011, which is five years ago from this week, uh, till uh, September 30th of 2014, which is two years ago. So the data uh, that the, the hospitals are going to get to tell them if they're doing a good job or doing a bad job um, they won't get it till June, and at that point, that data will be three to six years old. So you can imagine uh, how hard it is to improve a situation uh, where your data is three years old, and that's why the one person said in the question, is there anything to do to improve it? And yes, I'm going to talk about that um, here in a few minutes, but it's been a very frustrating thing. And Medicare uh, published uh, last month that the, the fines for 2016 
will be 2,597 of the hospitals, and there's a, um, about 5,600 hospitals in the United States that are on the Medicare program. So um, that's about 46% of the hospitals. Uh, the total fines will be uh, $528 million. And so um, the largest hospital uh, last year was in the state of Florida, happened to be the largest Medicare provider in the United States as well, and their fine was $3.3 million uh, for 2015. So you can imagine uh, when a hospital is, is, um, is given a $3.3 million haircut on their Medicare reimbursement, that uh, that is not representing care that they didn't give. Uh, that's care that they're just not getting paid for. And um, so that's going to cut into the bottom line of hospitals, and that means there'll be less nurses hired, there'll be less services provided, and it's, you know, it's uh, most of the hospitals in the state of Florida, uh, for instance, are not-for-profit, not and any excess they have usually goes back into the community as a reinvestment. So uh, this is a very tragic what's happening and, and it's based on data that the hospitals uh, traditionally have not even had access to. And so even if you make a change today and you want to get this better, it's not going to affect your penalties um, because tomorrow we end the 16th fiscal year. So if you say I want to do better in fiscal 2017, you're not even going to see the beginning of your data and, uh, based on what Medicare gives you until 2018, and you won't get fines on that until uh, 2019. So, I mean, that's when you actually see, start seeing your data. So it makes it very hard to be, do performance improvement. So Maggie uh, has indicated there's another question, so let's take a break, and if there's any questions on this slide, uh, most people are not aware of how this really works. Go ahead, Maggie. Thank you. We actually have two questions. The first is in regards to the figures that were on this slide. What percentage of these figures do you think are due to a possible language barrier? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, hospitals for the last few years have had to uh, provide interpretive services as part of what they do. And, and there's some very interesting ways that's provided. One is through what are called blue phone systems where they actually, um, where we used to rely on interpreters who come to the room, uh, now they actually have uh, systems where they put two, uh, two blue phones in the hospital room and the caregiver and the patient are each on the phone on their individual phones in the room and an interpreter from up to 70 different languages can immediately access and translate a conversation uh, right away uh, if there's a language barrier. But the bigger barrier in healthcare today is not the language barrier. It's actually what we call health literacy barrier. And what I mean by health literacy is you notice when I say things, and I'm teaching, and I come from, a, I'm board certified in family medicine and clinical informatics, so part of my role is to translate very difficult things into easy concepts that people can understand. So if I say congestive heart failure, uh, you may know what that is, but uh, another person may know that as well, fluid backing up into my lung, or my heart's not pumping well, or I've got a bad heart. So we have to be careful uh, in how we talk, and often uh, we write things out for patients, or we talk to patients uh, thinking that they have graduate degrees, uh, like our doctors do, when in fact uh, we need to keep it down to the fourth grade or sixth grade level for most people. and. We don't always take time to what we call read back the information. And so one of the strategies that we need to do is to uh, coach patients and help them to understand their disease process so they're less confused and scared of the process and understand how to uh, take medical advice and uh, to talk, uh, communicate and dialogue back to their caregivers and make sure that they're really understanding uh, what's being asked and, and asked of them 
and what the treatment plan really is. And um, you know, we often, and that's why I like to ask questions during these talks, because I may say something that you may not be familiar with, but I try to take it to a, a level, a, a different tier level, so that if you don't understand the more technical term, you will understand the more practical term. And I don't think as a health system, uh, as a health industry, we're doing a very good job with medical literacy or healthcare literacy and really taking the time to let our patients repeat back to the point of them explaining back, what did you understand of this plan of when you go home? Help me understand what, what you think I told you to do. And it's very interesting to listen what goes back. And our nurses do a great job every day in our hospitals of playing that role of the doctor tells them and then the nurse goes in, repeats what the doctor says, and then say, do you understand this? And, and repeat it back to me. And that should be the process of every safe and effective discharge from the hospital. And, every, and that includes transition from an office practice as well, where the patient's going home from my office uh, back into their home. And uh, they may be scared, they may have fear, or they may have misunderstood what I'm talking. So thank you for that question. Second one. Thank you. Uh, the second one is more of a comment that maybe you can speak to. It says that the healthcare payer is pushing to reduce the cost of healthcare through reducing and limiting services, which contributes to readmissions as well as faulty outpatient services. Do you think that perhaps readmissions are simply a symptom of the problem? Well, I, I, th I think that um, um, reducing costs has to do with being judicial with how we're reducing costs. And the United States healthcare market is a very unique market. Uh, you know, if you look at single payer systems like uh, Great Britain, um, I was talking to um, someone at the airport the other day who was telling me her uh, father uh, is currently going through dialysis, and he's uh, 87 years old, and he's on his sixth year of dialysis, and um, she was telling me how she wished we had a single payer system like Great Britain. And, and I said, well, uh, I don't think your dad would agree with you. And she said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, in Great Britain, the single payer system, the government system does not provide uh, dialysis past the age of 60. So basically, um, the way they, they save money is by rationing the service. And at certain age, um, your life expectancy is considered below the threshold that we want to, we can afford to invest in it. And so basically those services aren't offered based on an age cap. United States, we have a, a little different uh, idea uh, where her 87-year-old dad has been on um, dialysis for six years, lives alone, and, and other than um, lives a very health, healthy lifestyle. My 87-year-old dad just uh, Sunday returned from a three mile or three month uh, trip from Tampa, Florida uh, to Alaska and back um, in his RV by himself with his cat. So we look at health as more of a, a personal thing and and uh, not as uh, based on age or statistics. But the thing I wanted to make about the slide is the payers, be it private payers, um, and the government payers um, are prepared to invest heavily in chronic care management in the home and do. And they provide home health, they provide rehab services, they provide uh, remote patient monitoring and chronic care coaching, but less than 2% of the people that are eligible that are even getting that. So it's more of a mismatch between finding the right people and getting them in the right care. And as you see, the average person with six or more um, admissions or six or more chronic conditions and almost all the people in the congestive heart failure group are a, a, a good majority of them, 55% of them, uh, they end up in the hospital um, lots of times. I mean, more than three times a year, they're in the doctor's office more than every month. And um, if they could be managed at home at a lower price, I mean, the cost of an office is it now maybe $200, the cost of remote patient monitoring is about $70 a month. So keeping a person functional in the home is probably going to prevent them from being admitted to the hospital with an acute crisis. So 
I, I don't think the problem is we're scrimping on, on uh, access to care. I think our access to care is actually better than any place else in the world um, based on the fact that we don't have these uh, arbitrary age cutoffs. But I think we have a mismatch of care where people don't know what's available to them and health systems haven't looked at a comprehensive strategy. And they've often looked at reimbursement for acute care, which is what I talk about, the Medicare A, which pays for hospital care. Um, we tend to look at that care as isolated care, but health systems are now more integrated and more interested as physicians have joined them and uh, they now have uh, forayed into nursing homes and into home health. We now have a better integration of the healthcare delivery model, and there is a vested interest uh, through healthcare reform to start looking at the individual patient and managing their care, whether they're in the hospital or not in the hospital, and not treating the hospital care as a silo and treating the outpatient care as a silo and treating what happens in their home as a silo and never the twain shall they communicate to each other. We really need to be taking care of chronic disease as a as a um, life event and not as a um, and it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, where before we have really treated it more as episodic care. We need to treat more uh, um, comprehensive care. And one of the great uh, innovations uh, has been uh, what we call the patient-centered medical home where they actually, uh, many doctors are participating in this in my own specialty of family practice, and uh, they become a patient-centered uh, medical home. And from that office, they help to coordinate that the patient gets these services they need, whether it be remote monitoring, whether it be uh, televisits, uh, and more of a uh, continuum care model rather than an episodic care model. And these have been quite successful at reducing costs, reducing readmission, and uh, prolonging quality of life. So um, can't say enough about those. Any other questions in the queue, Maggie? Yes, we just received one that says, do you think provider-based billing has patients so irritated with the health system that they're not following due to the money issues? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and by provider-based care, I assume you're talking about fee-for-service care. Um, I think the whole healthcare care model has um, been a very interesting um, journey that we have in the United States. And there's a small percentage of the population that's actually gone to what we call concierge medicine, where you actually pay your, your doctor a monthly retainer and they do whatever it takes to to help you stay well. And um, this whole idea that um, uh, you get reimbursed by doing tests and you get reimbursed by seeing the patient in the office, um, we, we ought to be thinking more longitudinal models. And next month we'll talk a little bit about what's happening with the MACRA Act. Uh, that's the health care reform that's allegedly starting January 1st. Uh, the, the whole plan is not finalized till November, so if I talk to you at the end of October, um, hopefully we'll know whether it's going to affect January, but it's going to provide some new payment models um, for Medicare at least, uh, which will provide uh, for a model which will allow more collaboration between the doctors and the patients. Uh, and uh, really uh, benefit those who have set up these uh, primary, uh, primary care patient-centered medical homes. And if you're in one of those, you know, certainly take advantage of those. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that next month. So I, I think I'll push some of that downstream. But I think we could do better. Um, but I also think that government regulation is fastly uh, increasing the complexity of healthcare. And with this new reform that's happening next month, I will tell you uh, there's a lot of reporting requirements. And with Obamacare, there were 128 new federal regulatory agencies created, which have put more burden on health care to do more reporting and, and more management uh, that's not providing, I think, uh, and this is my opinion, I don't 
see where 128 new regulatory agencies are going to make the care any better, but it certainly is going to consume resources and uh, cost the nation more money at a time that we're running deficits and we're borrowing money just to provide what we are providing and we can't keep it up together. So um, we, we, we need to get out of this um, more regulatory burden and, and get more into um, common sense models that provide care uh, such as health savings accounts which helps the patient be more active in, in managing their care because they have some dollars that they can uh, invest in their system tax-free and to help to keep control on costs by being smarter about how they consume health care dollars. Okay, so let's move on here. This is a fun part um, because most of you have never seen a cause and effect diagram, but I, I wanted to put this in a graphical view uh, because I want you to understand the complexity and whether you're a healthcare executive, a physician, a coder, a patient, and we're all patients, um, I, I just want you to understand how complicated this all is and I didn't even include all the regulatory agencies that are playing on it, but I, I want to give a shout out that the cause and effect diagram is a, a tool used under uh, a Japanese technique called Six Sigma. It was uh, developed by Dr. Ishikawa, who's a Japanese uh, researcher in industrial uh, engineering and uh, it's also known as a fishbone diagram and you'll see why because it looks like the bones of a fish. Um, and I'm going to use an example before we talk about why hospital readmissions are occurring. We're going to talk at a common problem um, and I went backwards, I'm sorry. So here's a fishbone diagram I did for fun um, just to um, get you oriented to what we're looking at. So uh, if our problem is our teenager being late for school, um, there are multiple factors that contribute to our teenager being late for school. So for instance, the person, uh, the teenager himself or herself, um, they may be oversleeping. And the reason they're oversleeping is because they go to bed late. And the reason they go to bed late is the parents haven't instill any any bedtime or curfew and I could have put other factors in there they watch TV late at night they're surfing on the web they're playing uh, massive multi uh, person uh, role-playing games on the internet um, and then uh, maybe they don't like school maybe they're not prepared and they forgot to do their homework so they don't want to show up so there's a lot of person factors on, on why a teenager might be late for school and then the home factors uh, may be that uh, it's just a noisy environment and it's difficult to sleep because there's too much noise. Maybe the parents are uh, playing stereo music late at night or having parties uh, or maybe they don't own an alarm clock and the, the kid doesn't know when to get up. And then there's uh, culture. Um, maybe there's no consequences for tardiness and so why bother not to be tardy? Uh, so consequences like uh, from the school. Maybe they don't have any consequences at the school system if you're tardy. Uh, maybe the home doesn't have any consequences. So that can certainly play into this problem. And then there are external factors which may or may not be out of our control, such as uh, in climate weather. Maybe there's a snowstorm and there's six feet of snow and, and we just can't make it to school. Uh, or maybe the transportation is not, a, un, uh, is not available. So maybe the school bus is broken or I was expecting my friend John to pick me up and, and he's out of gas uh, or he overslept. So, um, so I hope this makes sense. This is a cause and effect diagram, fishbone diagram, and it's just kind of a way to look at. So, and I put up in the corner, um, anybody who learned the old childhood song that there was an old lady that swallowed a fly, I don't know why she swallowed a fly, I think she'll die, and then she swallowed the spider to, kill the, to catch the fly, and then she swallows the bird to catch the spider. Uh, that's what a cause and effect diagram is in song, is the old lady who swallowed a fly. So I hope that's a little humorous introduction to this very complicated diagram that's coming up next. So let's look at this. Um, so here's a cause and effect diagram that I, I made a, about a month ago when I was thinking through this problem. And um, 
if we look at readmissions and, and escalating costs in our healthcare system, um, we have data problems. And as I said, uh, we don't have a lot of timely data. And we don't have a lot of timely benchmark data, comparative data. Um, the data we're provided comes to us by uh, Medicare or CMS, the Centers for Medicare and uh, Medicaid, um, three years later. It's not very timely, and it's too late to really affect uh, payment penalties. And then we don't have effective uh, CDS, which stands for Clinical Decision Support, uh, which is the ability to warn us um, when a, a problem may be occurring to give us an uh, important information. Patient factors, I talked about healthcare liter illiteracy, not being able to understand, lack of coaching, education gaps. Uh, and then there's the patient controlled uh, lack of accountability. Maybe the patient doesn't want to be compliant. Maybe they don't know what that means. Um, so we have compliance problems. And then out in communication, um, we uh, may have not done a good job of clearly identifying what the medication plan is and the way we've managed the medicine. Maybe the patient doesn't know what they're supposed to be taking or what each medicine is done. They don't know about uh, whether to get refills. They don't have a list of their meds. And that we haven't done a good handoff between the hospital and the primary care physician, which is the PCP. Uh, so we're, um, we haven't done a very good job of fine-tuning post-dose discharge. Over on the prevention side, uh, we don't always have good predictive analytics, which are models to tell us that this patient's at higher risk of readmission than another patient might be. But we have an incredible amount of data to say if a patient has six or more health system health conditions, uh, they're more likely to be readmitted. So this isn't rocket scientist science, but a lot of people aren't paying attention uh, to think this through and, and put that into their model. And then we probably lack good primary prevention efforts, which is keeping these diseases from happening in the first place. The population <coughs> is not only growing in numbers, but growing in size. And uh, we, need, we, we have a lot of disease processes in the chronic disease category that are affected to our, our life habits, our diets, our activity levels, whether or not we smoke, our alcohol consumption, and now add to that uh, uh, new medications such as uh, marijuana that are entering the market and have uh, some health uh, effects. And then, um, as I said, our interventions are not good. We often delay hospital follow-up. Uh, we often don't have good workflows. Uh, we don't. Uh, we we rarely have in-home monitoring going on, and um, hospitals often don't even have the right equipment um, to be able to. Um, make uh, patient-friendly devices uh, that are good for to use in the home and to use them in the hospital to transition the patient so they're aware of how to do things before they leave home. And the data is really the area I want to focus on for the next this last half hour uh, because I think we have a huge opportunity uh, to improve that data stream. But before I go on uh, from my fishbone, Ma Maggie said there's uh, another question in the queue, so let me take a breath and uh, answer the question, Maggie. Okay. Um, this guest has a question about patients that they've seen in their practice. They found that a lot of the patient's chronic diseases are caused or worsened by obesity. Mm -hmm. Do you think obesity should be considered as a chronic disease to be managed in conjunction with other treatments? Uh, yes, I yes I do. I I think obesity is probably the number one lifestyle issue that we have in the United States, and it's very interesting that obesity is tied very closely to what we call hyperinsulinemia, which means um, uh, elevated levels of insulin, and um, we have a very vicious cycle in our. Um, food chain right now uh, with hyperinsulinemia. And um, um, hyperinsulinemia, insulin when it is too high in the bloodstream is usually a response of the fact that we're eating too many simple carbohydrates, too much refined foods. We're stimulating the pancreas all day long to kick out more insulin. That insulin is a, what we call an antibiotic hormone. Uh, antibiotic means it helps to build things in your body, to build muscle and to build fat. 
and in most cases you're consuming excess calories. Insulin is trying to drive that blood sugar into the cell. You have more than you need, so your liver is uh, making glycogen to store the uh, insulin, uh, the blood sugar, and the uh, fat cells are soaking up uh, the uh, through conversion of triglycerides. Uh, in the liver, we're creating more triglycerides, and we're uh, storing those excess calories in the form of lipoprotein or adipose tissue. Uh, I'm sorry, adipose tissue, which is fat, especially visceral fat or the fat inside your abdominal wall and throughout your body. Uh, this then leads to uh, disruption of some of your hormone cycles. In uh, men and women, it raises your estrogen levels. That estrogen level uh, then suppresses in men your testosterone-estrogen ratio, where men should have a very high level of testosterone to estrogen, but when the estrogen levels go up and the testosterone level stays the same, your effective testosterone relative level to your estrogen level drops. Um, even, even though, um, and that has metabolic effects on you, um, which we all know because that's advertised every day on the TV. Um, and women are seeing increases in things like breast cancer and other estrogen-associated diseases. Um, we're seeing increase in hypercholesterolemia. Uh, certainly, um, excess weight is associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes. Um, which we're now seeing in children, where we only used to see that in adults, hypertension, uh, heart disease, stroke, uh, and a variety of other chronic diseases. So uh, obesity is probably the biggest factor, and um, we probably are lacking in a good medical model of that because uh, we have a, uh, a government food pyramid that was pushed down our throats for 30 years telling us to eat at the bottom of the food pyramid lots of simple grains and simple sugars and that was the key to health and we now have Americans that live on uh, soda and and uh, potato chips um, and uh, that's not what's meant as a healthy diet and uh, it starts in our teenage years it's leaching calcium out of our bones um, and it's causing these excess calories which lead to all these other chronic diseases. So yes, if you can tell, I have a master's in physiology and so this is a topic near and dear to me and uh, I, I think we have a major problem there. So okay, so let's talk about the data. So we don't have the data, but everyone knows what, what we measure gets better. And so that's been shown over and over and over ago. But we have this system put together from Medicare that basically penalizes hospitals for readmissions, but then don't provide you the data until the penalty comes. And I've already summarized what I wrote here, that uh, 2016 fiscal year for Medicare ends tomorrow, and uh, the data for fiscal year 2016, uh, the penalties will be based on 2011 to 2014 data, but the penalties for the care that you did in 2016 uh, will begin to penalize you uh, for fiscal years 2018, 2019, and 2020. So even if you made a change in the upcoming year, in 2017, you're really not going to see any benefit till 2020. So you better be starting now. And, you know, there's the old story about uh, every morning in Africa, uh, a lion, uh, every lion gets up and and runs in the savanna, and every morning every antelope gets up and runs for, for the um, in the savanna. And the slowest uh, the slowest um, antelope will be eaten by the you know by the fastest lion, or the or and um, so it doesn't matter if you're a lion or a, or an antelope. You better you better hit the ground running when you wake up every morning. And we're we're not doing a very good job with this. So. I've been uh, currently piloting a solution with a major health system uh, based here in Florida. Um, we will be in full pilot uh, during this coming quarter uh, where we're able to actually give the health system uh, their readmission and their mortality data for every patient that crosses their threshold. That's part of CMS. And uh, we're going to follow those patients 30, 60, 90 days uh, for these chronic conditions and then 120 days for the joint replacements and we're actually going to start making real-time models so that we not only know what happens to the patient, even if they go somewhere else, 
but we're actually going to know when does the patient actually see the doctor uh, when they first leave, and we're going to start creating uh, analytics uh, to look at patients readmitted versus patients not readmitted, look at patients with multiple chronic diseases most versus patients with, without multiple chronic diseases, and, and really try to better uh, build better predictive models so that uh, hospitals uh, know how to better manage this. And I'm very excited with what we're doing, and this should be com commercialized early next year. Um, and at the end, if you are interested in this, please uh, email me, and I've got my email at the end. Um, but um, even if we, when we have the data, we have to know what works. So without the data, it's hard to know what our problem is at a health system level. So is it that we're not doing timely follow-up? Is it that we're not seeing the congestive heart patient in two days, but we're seeing them, telling them to see them in a week, but in actuality, we're actually seeing them in 14 days or 10 days? Um, are we leveraging remote monitoring? Remote monitoring has shown to reduce uh, readmissions for CHF from anywhere from 44 to 67 percent. And, um, you know, it makes sense to me as a physician and an informatician, someone that works with data, that the best care is what is going on with the patient every day. And keeping these patients at home and, and really understanding what things are going. And today, remote monitors, um, you, when you're going on vacation, you can unplug the little unit that, that sends the data and take it with you on vacation and get to the hotel room and plug it in and, and you're flying on the beach in, in uh, Florida and, or California or Hawaii and you still can do your remote monitoring. And, and it's incredible what this will do and this is going to change. So um, I'm very excited with what's going on in the field and um, working with a lot of health systems that are interested in putting strategy together and how to take both the data acquisition and remote patient monitoring and to make this a reality with or without other modalities. So what are some of those additional solutions that we're working with? It's chronic care coaching. Uh, as I said, we've got a whole slew of people. Over 67% of Medicare people are considered to be uh, health care challenge as far as health care literacy. And so we need to do a better care. We need to get uh, coaching services available, either in-house or, or uh, there are organizations that can provide these for a small monthly fee to, to call patients and do coaching and, and do classes and do education and support. And certainly we should be doing these on the big six, the uh, CHF, the, the stroke, the, the ones I talked about earlier. And then uh, we can also create nurse call centers. And, some health centers, uh, health condition systems have their own nurse call centers and ask a nurse and things. Uh, but there are now services that will supplement a health system and provide 24-7 coverage. So they'll either do it at a subscription fee 24-7 for a health system or they'll do it um, or for an office that wants to get in remote patient monitoring of their patient population. And, um, or they'll do a supplemental. Maybe you don't need it Monday through Friday from 8 to 5, but you need it after hours on holidays and weekends and on the evenings. So uh, that can now be done, and there's so many services out there. But most health systems don't have anybody re even researching this, and they go to a, a vendor who does one thing, but they're not thinking about it strategically. They're just trying to find a technical solution, and they're not thinking about strategically how to put this all together. And it's a shame that 98% of the people that need these services are, are, are not getting them, and only 2% are. And then uh, new ways of doing vital signs. And, and I'm very blessed to be working with a company that's creating some very innovative ways to make vital sign acquisition easier and more accurate. And I envision a world where we're using these advanced devices not only at home but in the hospital so that when a patient transitions, they've always had a chance to interact with the equipment, take it into their home, and then have it available for virtual visits so that um, if they do need to talk to their doctor um, or nurse practitioner, they can do that through a video visit uh, supported by immediate vital signs so that the doctor not only can see you and talk to you but have the kind of data they would be making decisions on. And then telemedicine is, is the whole concept of the video visits. 
And uh, that has come a long way now. And there's a variety of vendors out there, uh, both in the private office environment and the hospital environment. But it needs to be extended. I mean, why would we not pick patients with chronic disease and put video visits as a follow-up within 24 hours or even 12 hours of an emergency room visit? So that when a congestive heart patient um, is in the emergency room and we avoided hospital stay, why not have a, a, a way to do a Visio visit 12 hours later uh, just to check on the patient and to eyeball them and to make sure that they're really doing okay and they haven't gotten worse or not responding to therapy the way you thought. And the other diseases that respond well to, to these are, are asthmatic children where often uh, you know, we, sh we need to do everything we can to home manage asthmatic children to keep them in the hospital where they have a uh, higher risk of complications and problems. So the, ultimately, um, CMS years ago said, you know, we're, they're all about the triple aim. And the triple aim is let's improve the quality of care we're delivering. Let's deliver it at a lower cost. Um, so that, and we do that by providing more value for the dollars that we spend. And, and certainly you could see from all the statistics I give you, that we have a, a major crisis that um, in the United States that no one's talking about, um, but we all know it's there. It's the elephant in the room. And if we don't uh, get this under control, the next step is go to a single payer system where we start rationing care and we won't have people on dialysis in the Medicare age and we won't be doing other things. And I don't think anyone in the United States wants to go the route of these other countries who are now all starting fee-for-service and other models and trying to emulate us because the, the single-payer systems are collapsing because they're not sustainable as the population is aging. And then ultimately improve the access to care and, and how better to improve the access by uh, providing these transitions to the home environment uh, that are safer and more effective often then bring them back into the emergency room or readmitting them. So like I said, I would promise uh, to give you my uh, email. And uh, if, you, if you have an interest in this, whether you're a physician practice or a health system or a health executive, and you want to have some time just to talk through this, uh, um, we'd, we'd love to talk with you. And uh, next month, uh, we're going to tackle the whole MACRA initiative and what that means for uh, outpatient care, which is going to affect uh, all the physician reimbursements. Um, obviously, those of you in the CODI environment uh, want to know about that. And I'll take a breath now and see if there's any final questions for our last 10 minutes. And thank you for joining. Thank you, Phil. OK, um, please remember to send all questions to all organizers so that Phil and I can both read them. We do have one housekeeping-related question regarding CEUs for this webinar. This webinar is worth 1.5 AAPC-approved CEUs, which will be sent out when you receive a copy of the presentation and the link to the recording. And you should be receiving that in three to five days, as well as a survey um, detailing your satisfaction with this particular presentation, as well as what topics you would like to see in the future. Okay, I don't see any more questions, so I'd like to thank everyone for attending Advise Health's webinar on population health. Advise Health offers monthly webinars that are worth CEUs and provides an array of additional educational services. For more information on our webinar and course offerings, please visit advisehealth.com and join us for next month's webinar on the hot topic of MACRA, which will also be presented by Dr. Phil Smith of Medmore. Dr. Phil, before we end the session, do you have anything to add? Uh, I just uh, thank you all for your attention. It looks like most people hung in there the whole time. And uh, um, give some thought to what I said. Uh, this is 
a topic. Population health uh, is of interest to all of us. Um, we need our healthcare system to be sustainable. We need to tackle this problem of chronic care, uh, both for our loved ones, uh, for our health systems, and for ourselves. Uh, think about prevention. Um, think about diet, exercise, fitness, and um, self-care, and um, what we can do to help uh, reduce healthcare costs in the United States and uh, provide accessibility, value, and good quality care for all Americans. And uh, with that, I say good day. Thank you, Dr. Phil, and I will see everyone next time. Thank you for attending.